I want you to understand something this morning. We're a family when we're the body of Christ. You might be visiting, but we're all members of, of one body. I really want you to understand this, okay? I get a little emotional right now for some reason. Stuff gets me. I want you to understand the beauty and the power and the privilege of this. You, you matter so much. You as an individual matter so much. Your output, your participation, your attitudes, your 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 life matters so much. And when we don't understand that, we don't realize what we do. When we don't go with the flow of God's plan and grace, we actually start living at the expense of everyone around us. We put demand on people. We, we put people in a position where they have to minister to us or endure us or bear with us. I, I'm telling you, we're a family. Your attitude is huge and important. Your life is to be a living epistle and an example. When you gather these kids up here, it wrecks me. A couple weeks ago, they, they gathered all the kids like you did, Pastor. And I lost it. I had a God moment. I started to cry uncontrollably. And I realized the heritage in these children and how God sees them. And they're innocent. And there's some of these kids are so tiny. He said, let's become like a little child. And I'm thinking, these children are, are teeny little tiny. And what you represent to them and what you impart to them could be transforming, could be uh, solidifying, and could be very, very valuable to their little precious lives. If we think that Christianity is anything other than Christ likeness, we're going to send different messages to little ones and other ones. And people look at the church and say, if that's Christianity, I don't want nothing to do with it because they think we're the representative of him they just think well I don't do church if that's what gospel is I don't want nothing to do with it your, your life matters so much this isn't a condemning message this is a sobering thing we're family we're part of something we have to understand that, that even in our homes when we leave here we don't get so familiar with one another that we talk some way or act some way that we never would around another person at church we've got to take this serious at some point without feeling condemned and like it's legalistic and say man my life matters a lot Come on, the same price tag is in on every person in this room. There's everyone in this room is of equal value to God the Father. You can't prove it otherwise. Every person is worth the blood of Jesus. There's not, a, there's not one with higher value. There's not one with lesser. Your Christ likeness, your life lived by grace is very important to the sphere of influence that you possess and obtain. And I just want to encourage you in that. It is not cool. It's not cool to, to think that Christianity is less than Christ-likeness. It's not church attendance. We're the church. We gather ourselves together for what reason? Why don't we forsake the assembling of ourselves together? What's the Bible say? Why do we assemble ourselves together? To stir one another up in love and good works. <laughs> I'm just being real with you. I don't know what you expect this morning. I never know what to expect. But this is stuff that's in my heart right now, so I'm just going to roll with it with confidence. You can't afford to just have attitudes. It's not about whatever. It's about Jesus being Lord, man. If, if what's coming out of your attitudes and your mindsets and your motives isn't produced in life, get a grip on that. Get along with God. Settle your heart. Get real with God and get that thing out of you because it doesn't bring life to anyone. There's a place in 2 Timothy where Paul said, I adore all things for the sake of, and you think he would say Christ and get spiritual with us. He tells Timothy to, to commit these things to faithful men, men that are going to run the race, men that are going to do something with what you give them and become that living epistle and product of what you impart. And then he talks about a farmer and being the first to partake, and he's telling Timothy to stay in this thing and Keep on sowing into faithful men, right? And then he goes on and he says, Therefore, I endure all things. You think he would say for the sake of Christ. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of Christ. He doesn't say that. He says, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. What he's saying is my life and my example matters so much. I'm not going to grow weary in well-doing. It's not an option. I'm not going to have a fit and throw a frustration. I'm not going to have anger and, and unforgiveness. It's not an option. Christ is in me and he's the hope of glory. Today is not a day to fall apart. Today is a day to stand strong and be an example to the people around me, the young little ones, so that we never teach people that Christianity is church attendance. 
Christianity is not church attendance. If you take your children to church and live less than Christ and pursue less than Christ, you're teaching your children without realizing it that going to church is a Christian. Living Christ is a Christian. Make no mistake about it. Pursuing is, it doesn't mean we're perfect, but let's get off of that weak phrase. Well, nobody's perfect. That can be a cop-out and a justification for your flesh. And all of a sudden, tomorrow is yesterday. No, we're growing up into Him in all things. And if He says it's possible, then bless God, it's possible. If He said we can walk in love, we can walk in love. If He said we can be merciful, then we can be merciful. This is not a season to have your heart hardened by life. It's a time to have it tenderized by the Spirit of the living God. I'm telling you, we're not people with a bunch of issues. We're people with an answer, and His name is King Jesus. Are you guys following me? I'm sorry I'm so passionate. I really realized I'm blowing up the video because I'm off the steps and I wasn't supposed to get off the steps. But you just see that I just forgot about the video. I'm backing up, my man. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> it's good I didn't have a shock collar on. <laughs> Listen, man, this is church. This is a family meeting. We gather to corporately celebrate what we've become a part of and celebrate the one so lovely. Come on, this is not a time for anything else. It's not just to come and be noticed. It's not hoping somebody rubs you and encourages you. You can be encouraged in the Lord. Now, I understand there's a time people get trapped in that, but we as the church, I'm talking to the church right now. We as the church got to grow up into Him in all things. You gather together for one reason, to lay down your life and love, to be there for others, and let your life shine, your light shine, and your life be a pistol written on the hearts of men so that they actually look at you and are encouraged. They got three other examples in their life that aren't so cool, but their mind drifts over to you and it just shakes them and convicts them because they can't believe these three because they have you in their heart and mind. You see what I'm saying? Why do you want anything less? Why do you want to just be right and have an attitude and live by issues? Come on, that makes a seed that doesn't die and fall to the ground and it's all alone. Man, if a seed would ever die and fall to the ground, it'll spring up and it'll bear much fruit. I don't want to live at the expense of you because love lays down its life for another. Listen to me carefully, church. Oh, I want to come down so bad. <laughs> do you see me? I'm, like, I'm just too far away. <laughs> Everybody slide your chairs click no. <laughs> I want to lay down my life. And I want to love. I want to follow Jesus. I've learned a long time ago that any man could have issues and attitude or things less than Christ. We've all been professionals. We were all born into Adam. We were all born into sin. We were all born into a lie. We were all in, born into a self-centered motivation. We were all born in to survival. And you must be born again. It is not a prayer to take you to heaven. It's a repenting of your heart that brings heaven back into you. So that you can walk like he walked. And truly follow him. Being a Christian is becoming love. Showing mercy. Just like God loved us and showed us mercy. Anyone that truly understands what I'm saying. Doesn't try to forgive. They become living forgiveness. Anyone that really understands what I'm saying. Doesn't try to pray just to obtain mercy. They get so touched by the mercy of God. That they become the mercy of God. What good would it do to receive all that he is for our own selves and fail to become who he is to those around us? If that's what we do, we've missed the whole point. It's not cool to leave church and have animosity in your homes. It takes two to tango. It takes one to make peace. You're not going to pull me in there anymore. I've been called out of darkness into the light. You'd say, well, we're only flesh. If that's how you identify yourself, please read your Bible. <laughs> well, we're all going to have our moments. 
Why don't you take that landing strip away so the plane stops having liberty to land? Why do you buy into what was when something new has come? Why are we conformed to the world instead of transformed by thinking completely different and now we walk in oneness with His will? Amen. Come on, I came to cheer you on this morning. I didn't have a clue what I was saying. When I got up here, I thought, we'll find out when I flip the mic switch on. <laughs> and it's just so funny because when I flipped it on, this passion came on me and these tears felt like they wanted to rise up. And I feel like God is wooing us in. Like a hen would brood her chicks. And he said to Israel in that day, he said, but you were not willing. Let's be willing. Let's be willing not to just be forgiven by God. Not just to be loved by God. Not just to be provided for by God. But to take on his spirit, his image, his nature. And become like him. The sons and daughters of God. Come on, darkness is not the problem in our cities. It's not darkness that's the problem. Darkness is the absence of light. No one walked into a bright room and said, hey, could you turn up the darkness? If the room gets dimmer, it's because someone turned down the light and ye are the light of the world. So let your light so shine before men that they see your life lived and your works and glorify the Father. Why wouldn't you want that testimony? Faith says, I want that testimony. Faith says it's all coming down and in that day, I want that resume. Unbelief in flesh and self-centered thinking says, yeah, but I have issues and they shouldn't have did this and I wouldn't feel this way if she wouldn't have. Well, I don't know why he had to. And none of that has anything to do with what I'm talking about. It's a distraction and it's a lie and it's the way that seems right to a man, but its way leads to death and destruction. And all of a sudden, you got three reasons on your fingers why you're not where you should be, which is already a low level of condemnation. And yet, when you look at the three reasons, none of them are the Lord. And I'm thinking we're probably being deceived, living out of our feelings, emotions, and our natural understanding and our friends' opinions. And we probably haven't allowed truth to make us free. I wonder if you do me very wrong today in the natural. I wonder if you cross lines and do something very out of line. How am I any less anointed, any less a son, any less forgiven, any less a merciful man, any less his than I was before you did that? Why would I let what you do override what he's done? Why would I let what you say override what he has already spoken? Why would I only be as strong as the weakness around me? Why would I let life speak louder than truth? Now the truth has come. Come on, guys. We're not living in a talk show. We're living in the kingdom of God. Amen. And the way we play has been totally changed. The way we live has been totally transformed. The why behind our life has been made brand new. I'm encouraging you and cheering you on this morning that we're the body of Christ. We've got an amazing Father. There's people that come to church that are mad at God and they prove they don't understand the gospel. I hear preachers say, I understand we all get mad at God now and then. I am not one of those preachers. I believe it's ludicrous to be mad at God. It just reveals our ignorance and our arrogance. We have no idea what we're doing when we're mad at God. We have taken life upon ourselves. We're in control. And he's our busboy. And he hasn't waited the table well. So we're not going to tip him. I'm just saying. That attitude needs crushed and conquered among us. Yeah, but I'm mad because I lost my mother. I'm mad because I lost this because they died. Listen, you ought to be glad that Jesus shed His blood and we'll never die. And we're going to live forever. And you ought to run all the harder, all the more. Because one day, faith says we'll rejoice together because of His great name. Or you covet life and you take life personal and you miss the one that gave you life. And all of a sudden, all these gifts are at the expense of Him instead of in the glory of who He is. And all of a sudden, you don't do what Jesus said. You don't love less. Your mother, father, your wife, your children, your houses, your land, and yes, your own life. Because unless you love less those things, you'll by no way, by no means, he said, 
be my wholehearted follower and disciplined learner, my disciple. He's the giver of life, people. Nothing is that didn't come through him. You wouldn't have children if it wasn't for him. You wouldn't have a heartbeat. You say, well, I never asked him to birth me. You don't even know what you're saying. Life is eating your lunch. And anger and an attitude is swallowed up the humility. And you can't see the glory of God. You ought to be glad you have a heartbeat because you have the potential for that thing to beat forever in his presence for all time. Amen. You want to throw that away because a temporal fallen moment of issues, feelings, and frustration? Don't you let the devil buy you out when you're already bought with the price. Don't you be for sale and live one day with an attitude that doesn't produce life. Come on, I'm talking to every face in this room, every heart that's in this room. You can't escape this message. I'm not preaching to your neighbor. I'm talking to you. If you're listening to this for your spouse, hoping they're hearing, I'm talking to you. <laughs> you all right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you're so funny. I've had so much fun with you. <laughs> you guys are good. I can tell. Do you see that I'm not mad at you? Can you tell that I care about you? Can you tell that I didn't come to set you straight this morning? I came to cheer us on in what we are. So we don't teach ourselves religion and let something sell us cheap when we're already purchased. You're not for sale. You're bought with a price and you're not your own. That's not mean. That doesn't mean God doesn't... Con it doesn't mean He's controlling you. It means He bought you out and everything you ever were so everything you are changes. I sang to the Lord so loud this morning... That, that I'm not his slave. I've been chained and tied to the identity of righteousness, but yet I'm not his slave to serve him. I'm his son. That he doesn't control me. He possesses me and he's won my heart and he's made me one with him. I just sang some stuff out that was so powerful to me. I said, I believe what the apostle Peter said before he knew what he said. He said, where would I go, Lord? No one else has the words of eternal life. I said, I don't come to you because there's nowhere else to go. I come to you because you're truth, you're amazing, and you've given me life. I don't come to you because, well, you're my only option. <laughs> why do you think God loves us so much? People say, I can't imagine why God loves me because they weigh their value based on their life lived and their performance or lack thereof. God loves you for your created value, your destiny, what's possible, what He looks like when He's in you and you're submitted. He loves to becoming one. He loves who He is in us. And He believes we're worth the highest price. The gospel doesn't expose your sin. The gospel removes your sin. So that it exposes your value you're created to be His Son. <laughs> My whole life I heard Jesus died on the cross because I'm a sinner. He didn't die on the cross because I'm a sinner. He had to die because I sinned. He died on the cross because I was a lost son and there was destiny to be restored. You don't die on the cross for a sinner. You die on the cross for something redeemable. You don't pay a high price for nothing, church. Come on, I know you folks. You don't write the check unless you think what you're buying is worth it. In fact, most of you think you got a bargain. That's why you're writing the check. Well, when he wrote the check in the blood of his son, he believes the purchased possession is well worth the price. Because he knows your destiny. He knows your potential. He knows what life looks like in the spirit. And if we're not careful, we'll relate to the flesh. And we'll let him be a positional thing in our life. But this is our reality. That is not the gospel. If you live in the spirit, you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. The Bible talks about crucifying the flesh. The flesh has one place in your life to die and be realigned to the truth of the spirit of God in you. You don't say, well, my spirit's willing, my flesh is weak. That's men apart from prayer. Read where you said that. It's men apart from prayer. No, I've walked for 20 years in my bedroom. I thank you, God. I'm a spirit, I have a soul, and I live in a body, and my spirit dominates my life, and my soul totally agrees, and my flesh says, yes, sir. My spirit is strong, and my flesh is willing, and we're running together. Spirit, soul, body, sanctified, 
blameless till you come. Come on, man. That's great. You're going to come up with a reason for being less than he is. And you're going to justify your flesh and stay there and violate your conscience and grate yourself out. Put a veil over your face and never draw really near to him. And you'll just serve him instead of getting to know him. And serving him will take the place of knowing him. Church attendance will take the place of knowing him. Your Christian t-shirt and screensaver and ringtone will take the place of knowing him. And all of a sudden, men will look at your life and you appear to be Christian. But you know him from afar. And you get put in a pinch and you let somebody do you wrong. And you let somebody squeeze your life a little. And all of a sudden, you realize what's really inside of you. And then you realize what you really are. I said it three times this week. I'll say it the fourth. When you squeeze an orange, you expect orange juice. If you got apple juice, it wouldn't be weird. Why isn't it weird when you squeeze a Christian and get everything but Christ? Maybe we see our need for a Savior, but we don't understand He wants to transform us into His image and restore us back to love. And love takes no account. Church, love takes no account doesn't even consider the wrong that's done to it. <laughs> you imagine Jesus going to Golgotha? He's beaten beyond <coughs> description. According to what we're celebrating today, it's happening about a week from now. He's beat beyond description. They just released Barabbas, a man that supposedly killed a man and raised up conspiracy in the town. They have him as a prisoner. The people gladly celebrated and released Barabbas at the cost of Jesus. The guilty already going free before he even died on the cross. It's amazing. And he's standing there bloodied and beaten and now he carries his own cross to Golgotha. Could you imagine Jesus getting analytical? Could you imagine him thinking about Barabbas and how offending that is? And that all he's ever done is good and this man killed a man and they're going to release him and, and I multiplied their food and I opened the prison doors and I set the bound free and everyone that come to me I healed and everyone I touched was made whole. And all of a sudden his mind starts spinning and he's got the cross and he just keeps thinking, Barabbas? Are you kidding me? Barabbas drops, Father, I don't even know what I'm doing anymore. These bunch of people, these stick that they'll never change. God, are you kidding me? I've laid down my life for them. I've come on God and I put on flesh to save them. And this is what they do to me. Look at my face, God. I've healed all their sick. I've helped them. I've opened the eyes of the blind. I've given them truth. I've given them every opportunity to come to you. And what do they do? Look what they do. Look, I'm done with this. Look, if they didn't change by now, they're never going to change. I don't even know why we love them. I don't even know why we want them. I'm, I'm not going on the cross. I'm not going on the tree. I'm not doing it. They're not worth it. Look what they've done to me. Sounds foolish in his mouth, doesn't it? Because we know him through the word. It ought to sound foolish in your mouth. You're made in his image. That attitude, that reasoning, Man, we can understand it because we've all felt that way. But Jesus doesn't even know what we're thinking. Because love never fails. That thing didn't even go through him. People say Jesus loved us and he proved it by not coming down from the cross. He was the Lord. He could have came down if he wanted. That's incorrect preaching. Love never fails. He's not even thinking coming down. <laughs> love's not proven because he didn't come down. Love's proven because he came. <coughs> Of course he didn't come down. He's the lamb slain. You say, well, he said, if there's any other way, if there's any other way, take this cup from me. If there's any other way, Lord, nevertheless, be your will. What's he saying? What's he doing? Is he getting cold feet? Is he backing out? No, he's facing the price that must be paid for every man's sin in one human body, in one human soul. I personally, you can study this out. I don't preach it much on tape because it can be controversial. But the Bible says, and you follow me, Pastor, Romans 5 says, Adam sinned and death entered the earth. And because all sinned, all died. Guess who never sinned? Jesus. Guess who death had no power over? He kept saying, you don't take my life. I give it freely. <clears throat> when he's getting beat, 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 some of you that are nurses and medics and people like that, 
How do you beat a man beyond description? How do you mar a man more than any of the sons of men and he's still talking and quoting scripture and he can't die? He, he, you can't kill him. Did you see the movie The Passion? It's pretty hard to watch, huh? I tell every Christian you ought to watch it. Put toothpicks in your eyes and put your neck in a vice and stare. Say, <laughs> so, well, it's too gruesome. Maybe we better get real. Maybe it was worse than the passion. Maybe the beating was worse. Who believes it was worse? Because actually in the movie, The Passion, you could still recognize the actor. But he was marred more than any of the sons of men. Watch this. I don't believe Jesus could die until he was put on the cross and made to be sin. Death had no dominion over him. He had never sinned. He was free according to the law. He had dominion over death. Adam, the day you eat the tree is the day you surely... Why did he say that? Because he was never made to die. Why do we live forever? Because Jesus restored what was lost. Because God made us to live forever. And that's why we live forever in Him. The body's dead because of sin, but we're alive because of Him. Do you get it? And one day we're going to get a brand new body. <laughs> that's never known the flesh, never known weakness, pure and holy and yay, completely restored. I believe you could have beat Him till today and He wouldn't have died. I don't believe death had any power over him until he laid on that tree and they raised him up because anything hanging on a pole has been cursed by God. He did not curse his son on the cross. He made his son to be sin. He cursed what was killing us. And sin shall have no dominion over you. When you become a Christian, you're not getting the forgiveness of sin. You're dying to it to its actions, its stain, its memory, its drawl, its identity. It says, shall we continue in sin so grace abound? Certainly not. How shall we, Romans 6, how shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? Or do you not know? As many of you were baptized and buried into baptism with Jesus, you were buried into his death so that as surely as he raised, you too shall raise in the newness of life. It goes on to teach that the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives unto God. You likewise reckon yourselves dead indeed to sin. We hold that thing up like it's a poster boy, like we need to honor it, like it's a humble confession to boast in our ability to sin. Stop doing it, church. The biggest mistake we make is we think our ability to sin identifies us as sinners. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. If you fix your eyes on Him, it'll produce its fruit to holiness and you won't bite your lip and try not to sin. You'll live sanctified from the things that owed you. Come on. We're almost afraid to talk about it. You say, well, everybody makes mistakes. You're missing the whole point and you're going to keep quickly making mistakes because that's what you believe you can hardly talk in the church what grace does in a person. You can hardly talk in the church of how it's possible to live in righteousness and walk free from the things that owned us because everybody thinks it's heresy because we always relate to failure instead of redemption. And then our consciences stay grayed out. We stay self-conscious. We stay self-focused. And no wonder we lack power when we speak His name. Come on, this gospel is powerful. Somebody, who said it? Somebody, some, one of your people just said it. They were praying and they said about the, 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 the devil's like a chihuahua in the sight of God. And I, somebody said that this weekend. I heard it and I laughed and I said, they understand. You said it last night in the house. You got real passionate. I saw that thing come out of you, girl. Yeah. You were like, I tell you, we do too much boasting in the devil. And we just in the warfare, we're just putting him on a pedestal. And we're empowering him. And we don't realize how we're empowering him. He's like a chihuahua in the sight of God. And I'm like, yeah. I didn't want to amen too much because I didn't want her to slow down. I was like, yeah. yeah. Come on. The devil can't stop God. He can't even think about stopping God. All he's thinking about is stopping God in us. <laughs> and he can't if we don't let him. You're right, he can't, Katie. 
But watch this. You better not give him any place. You can't let him. Don't you let him have his way when he's been knocked out of power, knocked out of authority, and placed under your feet. Don't you co-labor with darkness. Don't you say it's okay to have the attitude that's not producing life. Don't you think it's okay to sit for a day in judgment towards another or with frustration and anger in your heart. Get a closer relationship with Jesus and live with a clear conscience and get true to the faith and let Holy Spirit help you in that. Renounce it and let Him put the new fresh thing called love inside of you. Don't sit and talk to people. Well, they shouldn't have did this. Well, no wonder I'm hurt because you'll talk to the people that feel like you and they'll cheer you on in the lie and that'll be your support system because everybody understands because they have pain too. <laughs> you talk to Jesus about it and see what He tells you. <laughs> Instead of calling your three friends to tell them your pain, and they go, I can't believe they did that to you. Oh, you must be so hurt. No wonder you feel the way you do. That is not the counsel of the Lord. That is pain ministering to pain. You talk to Jesus and ask Him how He feels about it. Now that an innocent man, completely pure, gave His life for you. He says, if He loved us this way, ought we not love one another? He says, love is perfected in this church. That we have boldness in the day of judgment. Do you know that in the day of judgment, men will cry out for the rocks to fall on them and the trees to bury them? Do you understand that men will run from the glory of who He is in that day? The Bible makes it very clear that it's a day of terror to the hearts of men. And it says, love is perfected in this, First John 4, 17, that we have boldness in that day. Because as He is, so are we in the world. That is not power and lightning and thunder and miracles. The whole chapter is, He is love, He is love, He is love. And as He is, so are we. <coughs> Beloved, let us love one another. Why in the world would I do that? You don't know who I live with. <laughs> See, when you talk like that, you reveal that you've became the same thing you focused on. Separate from God, because that's not His view. And you have your feelings all justified. And the rational way of man settles it in the court of your mind. And there's no place for change unless you challenge what you believe. You say, but they did me wrong. wonder if God said that to you. I wonder if your name came up before the throne and He said, but they did me wrong. In fact, they even knew better. They had a revelation. There was a season they walked with me and all of a sudden they got hurt and deceived. Got their eyes off of me. I feel so slighted. I feel so put on the shelf. I feel so second best. And now they're hurt and they want to crawl back to me. I don't think so. I've had enough of them putting my heart on a yo-yo. <laughs> Can you even imagine God even thinking that? Then why do we allow ourselves to when we're made in His image? I'll tell you why, because we learned our language from the fall of man, not the Spirit of God. We were homeschooled in a wrong home, and you must be born again. You were taught by false teachers your whole life, called life, the school of life. And Jesus said, don't you let anyone be your teacher. You have one teacher, and he's the Christ. So the truth came and set it straight. He had to take a whole chapter to say, you say, but I say, you say, but I say. Why? Because we don't say what he says. <laughs> he came to his own and his own knew him not. Nothing was made that wasn't made through him and yet he received not. Why? Because they were in darkness. He was the light. They looked at him and said, what is he talking about? He was face to face to the fall of man and they didn't even know the one that created them. They were so far gone in the fall at Lazarus' tomb. All they could see was death and life was standing right in front of them. Life was standing right in front of them. And all they could see was death. Jesus wept. Everybody thinks it's because he was compassionate over their feelings. Are you kidding me? He's getting Lazarus up in two minutes. He's not crying because he's dead. <laughs> He's crying because they can't see. 
Because they're going, he healed the blind. Couldn't he kept this man from dying? Jesus, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Didn't I tell if you believe? Jesus, if you die, we're here, my brother went. Both sisters, and then all the Jews in the background. Couldn't he have kept this man from dying? The whole time he's trying to say, I'm the resurrection and the life. Hello? He told his disciples he's dead. He's not sleeping. He's dead. They went, what? Yeah, and I'm glad for your sakes. Let's go. Go and get him up. They were so afraid of death that Thomas said right then, let's go die with the master. Because they thought if he go back to Judea, he's going to get stoned because they almost killed him the last time. They, could, they didn't even go, you're going to what? You're going to get him up from the dead? He said, listen, the Son of Man's going to be turned over to the hands of sinful men. They're going to persecute him and beat him and crucify him and he will die. And, what? and on the third day, he tells him like four times in the New Testament, and on the third day, he will rise. They couldn't even hear he'll rise because all they could hear is he's going to die. Man consumed with self-centered, temporal, in the moment, thinking and living. You better be careful you're not a Christian trapped in that. You'll never live by faith. Love will never be rooted and grounded in you. You always question it because of the moment. God, if you love me, why is this happening? God, if you love them, why did you let... God, why do you... If you love us, how... And all of a sudden, you're never rooted and grounded in the love. And faith can never work through love because it's always in question. Because it's always about you instead of his kingdom. Oh, I hope you're hearing what I'm saying this morning. I'm throwing a lot out to you. It's about 50 sermons. Well, that's good. But you can hear. You can hear it's solid. It's scriptural. How can you contest what I'm saying? It really can't be contested. It's amazing how I don't get rebuttal. People don't write me nasty letters because they listen long enough to go, ooh, it's there. <laughs> I'm not here to hurt you. I'm here to sow into and proclaim what God is doing so it's sustained and flows like a river in this area. Come on, we don't need Christians that are looking for an outpouring and hurt by their brother. Christians that want a manifestation of the Spirit and offended at somebody just not looking at them or talking of the simple stuff that we have. You know, just simple stuff, man. Agitated with people. You know, the phrase we've made up in the earth. Boy, they just get under my skin. The whole point is get new skin. Look, there was years in my life where I went to church and I believed that if God changed you, the world would be a better place. I'm like, God, why don't you just tweak folks? Just tweak them a little. People are so messed up. Would you just tweak them? Did you ever think that? Be honest with me. Did you ever think, God, why don't you just come and straighten folks out? That is so self-righteous and proud you're missing the whole point, but I missed it. I'm like, God, would you just change people? He's like, um, hello. <laughs> I want to change you, son. <laughs> because if he changes me, I see them different. Look, it doesn't take a man of God to pick out what's wrong in people. It takes a man of God to see they have destiny. Amen. Anybody can fault find and be critical. But who's willing to see the potential in a person's life when it's hard to see in the flesh? Come on, anybody can read a book by the cover. But who's willing to get deep into those middle chapters and find out the will of God for a man? You can judge a book by its cover all you want, but the Bible says don't judge a man according to the flesh. It, doesn't, it says don't look with outward judgment, but righteous judgment. Outward observation, but righteous judgment. You guys with me this morning? Yeah. Listen, we have this great privilege to run in the greatest race ever. It's the kingdom of God on the earth. Amen? I'm just going to throw this out in closing. It's not for your sake and for your blessing and for your provision and for your full vats in your barns so that your heart's transformed and like father, like son. So that you have the capacity to love and forgive and show mercy. The same way those things saved your life. They begin to save others because we're the body of Christ. Come on, you cannot allow your heart to be hard. You can't let a person become Lord in your life and dominate who you are. Come on, you think because you cut them off and don't talk to them anymore, you're winning? Are you kidding? You're a product of them. They're mastering you. They're pottering you every day you live that way. You're a product of that thing. 20 years later, you hear their name and you still remember it like it was yesterday. So for 20 years, you're nothing but a masterpiece of the thing. 
And you think because you didn't talk to him and you cut him off for 20 years, you won? You lost for 20 years. You became a product of the offense. Your life's rendered unproductive and you don't be found with the heart of God. And you think you're winning? You've lost a long time ago, friend. Until that thing repents and changes in you. You say, well, they just, well, I stay away from them. I bet you God doesn't. I bet you God's wooing them and drawing them. And speaking life over them. So why are you staying away? Why don't you at least speak life and pray from a pure heart when nobody's looking? What are you accomplishing by staying away? You're saying, I'm my own. It's all about me. And what doesn't work for me, I don't need it. If it blesses me, yay. If it challenges me, I keep it away. Come on, that's survival. That's the rat race that everybody's living when they're born. Trying to find their identity, where they fit in, and who they are. And by the time they're 5, 7, 10, 12, they're nothing but a product of how life's been. It's not even the real person. That's why it's good we get to get born again, because it wasn't even you in the first place. You're a product of your circumstances, who touched you wrong, who didn't touch you right. Come on, by the time you're 10 or 12, you're manipulated by the way life's been. Your story is your reality. But when Christ comes, everything changes. Thank God for new life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Somehow we think we're in control. No, we're being manipulated by everything we're going through and everything around us. That's why we make our memories so important. And yeah, but you don't know what I've been through, brother. I wish we'd switch that and say, man, let's think about what he's been through because that's the real me. Look, I realize your dad might have touched you wrong. Uncle Joe might have did you wrong. Look, you, you, you got a story and so do I and so does everybody else in here. That is not the truth about you. That was the lie set against you. You get your heart so hard and so deceived and so confused that when the good news came, there wasn't nothing good about it. In fact, you were mad at the God they were talking about because he let me go through all this. No, he put his son on the cross and let him go through all that to snatch you out of darkness and place you into the light. Man was born under sin and under the hook of sin. So God took care of that thing to get back at you and have access to you. And all we can say is, well, why did he let me go through that? Well, why did he put his son on the cross? Maybe we ask the wrong questions. Well, if God loved me, he wouldn't have... If God didn't love you, he wouldn't have killed his son. Maybe we ask the wrong questions. Maybe our questions have a personal tone and we're being deceived in our questions. They asked Jesus questions and how he's so cool. He said, let me ask you a question. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because he knew their heart and motive and they were already deceived and they didn't have an ear to hear because of where they were coming from. So he just turned the tables on them. He's amazing. Listen, I'll, just, I'll tell you this. This, is, this, is, this works for me. This is simple. This is childlike stuff. I'm not a deep fella. If what you're thinking and what you're giving your heart and emotions to isn't building you up, edifying you, or producing life, it is not from the Lord. Get your eyes off of everybody else. Don't you wake up in the morning for anyone to owe you anything. You wake up in the morning to love. And you will find that your day is amazing in the face of it all. And that you'll realize that life is a gift and a joy, not a dread and a labor. You guys okay? I came to cheer you on this morning. I thought I was going to talk about righteousness again and never got to all weekend. I like the topic. It's in my heart. I stood up here, I flipped on my mic and went... <laughs> you can tell I'm not mad at you, can't you? I have no need to correct you. I promise you I didn't fly to Wilmington to set you straight. I flew to Wilmington to cheer you on so you run with what God's doing and to see a bright smack in the middle. Amen. Amen. So you guys going to live this? You guys want to live this? Okay. Look, you might not even be born again in here today and somehow you got here. You just say, man, 
Why would I want this? I've been living for myself. No wonder I feel so hurt and angry and frustrated. I've made it all about me at the expense of it. Come on, guys. We, we've misused the three words that are most misused in the whole planet for all time has been, I love you. Because we all need love. Because we were cut off from love when man fell. So it's time to get grafted back in and become love. Stop being in need of love. The reason we've misused the words so bad is because we're all vulnerable to it and everybody needs to believe they're lovable. So when you say, I love you, it just works. People long to hear it. Unfortunately, we've hurt, we've done more damage with the words, I love you, than we've ever done blessing. How many people have gotten together starry-eyed and just, I love you, I love you, I can live without you. And they're hostile and bitter and mad at each other in six months. And don't even want to see each other. Each other wasn't even on the planet. But boy. And then we say it's falling in and falling out of love. No, it's called a needs-driven relationship. You're using the person to fulfill the vacuums in your life and they become your everything because you can't live without them because they make you fulfilled and complete. That's idolatry. There's only one that fits that description. So the person you say I love you to, you can degrade and curse the next day with your words. You can come together and have sex and have orgasms and think it's the most amazing thing. Wake up in the morning, put each other down and talk nasty to each other after being intimate. And we prove we don't even understand love. We're not even close. What we're saying is, I love you for me. I love you for how you make me feel. What we're saying is, I love you. Do you love me? <laughs> it is absolutely selfish to the core. Love never says, I love you. Do you love me? Love only ever says one thing ever. Love has one language, one sentence, one voice. And it simply says, I love you. And that's all it ever says. I love you. That's what God's doing through his crucified son. I love you. Yeah, but shh. I love you. Well, then how come I'm shh. I love you. You got to make sure you look to the right place. Or you'll be way deceived. You better slow down and tame down. And look at the right place to find love. If you look at your circumstances, you'll never get rooted, grounded, and established in love. And faith will never work through love. You'll always be driven by need. You reduce this book to principles that you apply and hope things change. You'll reduce Jesus to abracadabra or grant me my wish. This book introduces you into an intimate relationship with the one that created all things. This book isn't for you to study it and write promise books to quote in your bedroom so things change. It's to enter you into the truth of who he is so the truth of who he is lives in you. And then when you speak, you speak from what you know and believe. And there's authority and there's power and there's victory. You guys with me? Or it's all just gifting, and it's all just atmosphere, and it's all just, let's try to get in that right niche. No, it's I'm in you and you're in me, and one plus one has become a stronger one. I've given you all that I am so that all that you are, you can be in me, and I thank you for this relationship. Let's get it on. You guys with me? I could read you like, Tons of scripture. I can just turn from page to page and read you tons of scripture that call us into this life. It would be fun. I could almost do it. I actually got a little time. I'm early, man. I almost feel done now. I'm almost like almost done until I pull another string. <laughs> I actually, I actually feel really complete right now. I'll tell you what, don't ever read your Bible because it's what you're supposed to do as a Christian. That's weird. Don't do that. Don't get caught in, well, I better read my Bible, Pastor might ask where I'm reading. <laughs> <laughs> you read your Bible to know Him, not to qualify. You've qualified through Him. Now you read to know Him. There's people out there that say, I don't need to read the Word. I have the living Word inside of me. 
Stop being so deceived. Study and show yourself approved. Fill your heart with the Word of God. Listen, if you don't fill your heart with truth, you'll never discern a lie. The way that seems right to man will seem right. And you'll see your need for a Savior and you'll understand the cross and the love of God that forgives your sin, but you won't receive fresh and new understanding. So you'll live in the same fear, same anxiety, same frustration, and you'll never get challenged because the Word's not in you bringing light. You guys with me? Yeah. The Lord told me a long time ago, the reason I do what I do when I get up here, He told me a long time ago, He said, Dan, I'm putting revelations of my love and righteousness in you, and you'll be speaking to many of my people. He said, however, I don't ever want you to read your Bible just to preach a sermon. That's not, doesn't mean it's wrong to study and have sermon notes. Don't you compare what I'm saying. My pastor at home, he studies, he's thorough, man. It's, it's good. But here's what he said. Don't read your Bible to preach a sermon. That's in person, I'll see. Anybody can study their Bible long enough and preach a sermon. He said, I don't want you to do that. He said, read your Bible to know me and only ever speak out of who I am in your life. Then it'll carry authority. You follow me? I want to do a couple other things. I'm going to do a couple other things quick. If you want to, you can jot this down. If you, if you want to, you can get some Bible time, some word time, and just get alone and just go through some of this stuff. Like, read the last 10 verses of Romans 12. Man, it would be amazing. Read the second. Read, read the... Can I just give you some sections you might want to just read and just have fun with? Read the second half of Ephesians 4 and go into the first six verses of Ephesians 5. It's really, really fun. In fact, you can read right to where he talks to husbands and wives. And if you're married, you, want to, you might want to keep going. Let me just say, just read the Bible. No, seriously, read, read Ephesians 4. Right after he talks about the gifts in the body of Christ and, and no longer tossed to and fro, the unity of faith, the stature of Christ. Then he talks about Christian living and what it looks like. So the second half of Ephesians 4 to about the first six or seven verses of of Ephesians 5 is phenomenal. Amen? And then uh, just read, you want to do something really cool, just read Colossians 1, 2, and 3 consecutive without taking a break. Just read it through as one letter. And it's really amazing. I'll just stop there, okay? Because I'll just give you... People say, what's your favorite scripture? And I think I have one, and then 20 more bombard me. I just love the Word of God. It brings life. He didn't say... Go into the world and make confessing Christians that attend church. He said, go into the world and make disciples. I'm not playing with words here. Pay attention with this. I, don't, don't, don't take this lightly. Watch. He didn't say, go make confessing Christians. He said, go make disciples of all nations. And in John 8, he defines a disciple. He said, he who continues in my word, not his feelings, not his emotions, and not his friend's opinion. He who continues in my word is my disciple indeed. A disciple means a wholehearted follower, a disciplined learner. He who continues in my word is my disciple indeed. He will know the truth. That's, that's the light coming on, guys. And you don't have to look this flaky, but I'm just acting out. The, the truth making you free is like, duh, yeah, whoa, wow. Oh. It could just be... Sitting in tears is pouring because you finally see it. I see it. You do love me. You got it. You see me. This. And all of a sudden, he who the sun sets free is what? It's not some spooky spiritual thing. It's the revelation of your heart. It's your heart exploding with understanding. It's your eyes opening and going, yeah. How's that going to happen? Because you continue in the Word. Not your feelings, not your emotions, not your friend's opinion.